Hi, I'm Will Hughes and this is the third video on the topic of construction procurement. In this one we're going to explore the three main generic methods of procurement with a focus on general contracting, design build and construction management. We're going to look at their historical context and what they mean today. Throughout this video I will tend to focus on the building industry and the role of the architect. Please remember that in the civil engineering industry the same things apply even though the vocabulary is different. Instead of an architect, a chartered civil engineer would be expected to be leading the design and would be present during the construction. Of course, whether it's an architect or a civil engineer, the lead designer is usually not liable for the construction work, but the lead designer is of course liable for the design. I spoke in the first video about the information being uncertain and incomplete. This is why it's important that the lead designer is present during construction. It is to ensure that the design intent is properly reflected in what is being built. It is also important to adapt the design to continuously changing circumstances and make decisions about the quality of the work being carried out. So design continues throughout the construction process. With that said, Let's get on with looking at these generic procurement approaches. First up is general contracting. Now this is often known in the industry as traditional contracting or traditional general contracting, but I try to avoid calling it traditional and I put the word in inverted commas on the slide because it's not that traditional. It's a tradition that only goes back to 1830. Prior to the industrial revolution, this was not the way that we procured construction, for there was no such thing as a general contractor. Um, in the pre-industrial age, we had master builders who were responsible for design and construction and coordination and management and so forth. That was much closer to what we now call design build, ironically. Um, but in general contracting, what happened was that um, during the Industrial Revolution, more materials more new materials were being incorporated into the construction process. Cast iron, concrete, reinforced concrete, steel, and so forth. This led to the emergence of an increasing number of trades um, and also to specialized design professions. What this means is that the more different types of skill that you have involved in work, the more management overhead there is in dealing with the interfaces and coordinating all the different types of work and flows of information. So the management load goes up because of this extra coordination as um, different trades and skills are involved. So we got to the point where architects or civil engineers were really struggling to coordinate all of the work and projects were getting into trouble. So. Um, an ambitious contractor called Thomas Cubitt, C-U-B-I-T-T, in 1830 decided to make an offer of give us the design information and we'll do the rest. So they relieved the architect of the obligation of having to coordinate all of the different trade contractors on the site and the general contractor was born. So what happens in general contracting? is that we expect design information to be prepared by a design team who are independent of the contractor and provide the bidding contractors with the design information so that they can compete um, on their price for building that exact design. Now, for purposes of contracts in the UK, the word client is a little bit ambiguous and nebulous. So to be precise, we use the word employer to refer to the organization that is paying the contractor. So a construction contract or a building contract is a contract between an employer and a contractor. Now, you can see on this graphic that as well as the general contractor on the right hand side, the employer also is typically employing a series of designers. Um, I'm showing here the architect, the quantity surveyor, who is not a designer actually, but an advisor and a couple of different types of other types of engineer. Sometimes these design consultants are employed or by the architect. So they become subcontract designers or sub consultants or you know, some other word. 
there's a lot of confusing vocabulary around these things, unfortunately. Now, I said the quantity surveyor is not really a designer. Um, the RICS have made clear in their work in contract drafting that quantity surveyors are not making design decisions. The reason they make that clear is because they do not accept design liability and therefore they do not need the same kind of professional indemnity insurance as designers would do. That certainly was the story when I was involved with um, doing research at the Joint Contracts Tribunal in London, talking to all of the various parties involved in contracting about the vocabulary that they would be using in their contracts. Um, I'll put a note down below for a link to the document that was published as, as a result of that research, because you might find it useful to look at that study on roles in contracts and the terminology that's used to describe those roles. Anyway, the general contractor is responsible for the construction work and they tend to subcontract all of the work to specialists. This is because um, it's impossible to keep all of the trades busy from one project to another. The proportion of the different kinds of work differs in different projects. So it's very difficult to keep all of them busy all of the time. Um, and therefore, for the sake of efficiency and competitiveness, we tend to see them subcontracting the work to specialist subcontractors who therefore can switch themselves to different general contractors in order that they can keep their resources permanently busy as far as possible. And basically, there's two types of subcontractor. There are subcontractors who only install what's already been designed by the design team, and there are subcontractors who design the things that they install, such as air conditioning, for example, lifts, cladding, and so forth. Now, this is a bit complicated because the general contractor has no design liability, but if they're employing a subcontractor who does have design liability, that design liability cannot pass through the general contractor to the employer because the general contractor is not liable for design. Therefore, we have to set up separate contracts between a subcontractor who designs with the employer. So the design liability can go directly to the employer. This also means that whilst they're designing things, they may not be involved in the project till after the general contract is involved. So we go through all sorts of contractual tricks to try and get that kind of design into the design team. It's not easy. This is not the place to discuss it, but you can follow that up in your studies on contracts, subcontractors, and so forth. But the essence here is that the general contractor is coordinating the whole of the construction work based upon a design that's been prepared by the design team, and the general contractor takes responsibility for the construction work. So by contrast with that, we have design build, which is sometimes called integrated procurement. Although these days the word integrated tends to be applied to other methods that we'll be looking at later in these videos. But the key thing here is that the design build contractor is a general contractor who employs the design team. The employer still has advisors like QSs and so forth, um, but the design build contractor is completely liable for the design of the design team as well as for the construction work. Now, this is much closer to what we used to do before the Industrial Revolution, except that there were no professional roles defined until the middle of the 18th century. Um, so design build contractor has all of the liability, which gives the employer a single point of responsibility to deal with, which is quite attractive to many employers. On the other hand, the employer loses the direct relationship with the design team. So quite often, employers would commission a design team as if they were going to be general contracting procurement and they have their architect and engineers and QSs in place. But then when they bring in the contractor, they novate, N-O-V-A-T-E, novate the contracts to the design build contractor. So all the work that's been done up until that point under the uh, on, on the conversation with the employer, the liability for that is transferred to the design build contractor. So novated design build is rather a hybrid between pure design build and general contracting. Now the third one is construction management, direct contracts between the employer and the trade contractors with a consultant contract construction manager 
coordinating the work of the trade contractors. Now in this one, contractually, the construction manager has no liability for the work on site. That's with the trade contractors and it's between the trade contractors and the employer. So in effect, the employer steps into the general contractor's shoes by taking on liability for the interfaces between the trade contractors. So although they take on legal liability, they employ a construction manager to actually stand in their shoes and act on their behalf in terms of discharging that liability. But the essence here is that the construction manager has no contractual liability for the construction work. They're simply there to manage on behalf of the employer. All the other design team members are here in their normal roles that you would typically see. So that's the basic three methods. Construction management, of course, emerged in North America at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, um, and was a very um, wide, widespread procurement method in the building of skyscrapers and modern central business districts. There's a whole interesting story about the birth of skyscrapers and how cities like Chicago and New York were built using close relationships between construction managers and design offices. Um, so it would be worthwhile doing some background reading on those things if you have time. Okay, I'll leave it there for this one because I think I've used enough time. Um, and in the next one, we'll turn our attention further to the differences between these procurement methods. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheerio.